Danville was an ideal place to raise children. It was a rural place with places to swim in the Raritan and Millstone Rivers, then a pristine sanctuary. Their strong athletic abilities, civic pride, and their resourcefulness produced such athletic organizations as the Manville Athletic Club, the Western Bulldogs, and a semi-pro football team called the Manville Yellow Jackets. Manville was a rural area, a small little town who knew everyone in town. Uh, it was a really, a really a sport town. It was a football town and a baseball town. It was a hub of baseball and, and football. We had, a sem we had baseball, we had four, four baseball teams in town. We had the best football team in, in the state of New Jersey. Uh, our Manville Yellow Jackets, uh, uh, we played all over the state. We played in Pennsylvania. We played in Connecticut. We would get the best players in all, in all the high schools in the area. Uh, everyone wanted to play for the Manville Yellow Jackets. It was a great, great football team. And the war came on, and that was the end of our Yellow Jacket football team. By mid-20s, Manville's population grew to about 5,000 residents, one of the largest towns in Somerset County outgrowing its rural identity, but still governed by Hillsborough Township. There were two schools at the time, the Main Street School and the Camp Lane Road School. On October 8, 1928, another schoolhouse was authorized by Hillsborough to be located on Brooks Boulevard, and it was named the Roosevelt School. The first school doctor, Dr. Samuel H. Pogoloff, who migrated to Manville in the early 1920s from Oklahoma, was also Manville's first doctor. He made house calls, delivered babies, and many times was paid for his services in goods such as fresh vegetables, home canned goods, chickens, and eggs. He practiced for over 50 years and remained in Manville until his death at the age of 92. The resourceful immigrants and the citizens of this small community managed to create for themselves the comforts and recreation by unique methods. Mandel was chastised by Hillsborough Board of Education for its sale of spiritual liquors during the Prohibition days. In early 1923, it even called for an ordinance to ban showing of wooing pictures on Sunday so as not to corrupt the morals of children. Just five years before, in 1918, then Judge Daniel Beekman, a straight-laced judge, refused to grant a liquor license to Manville's two hotels, Greesheimer's and Becker's, because of the repeated disorderly behavior of his patrons. The feeling of being deprived by Hillsborough and not being able to provide for its own needs frustrated this, this immigrant community. Talk of secession from Hillsborough grew louder by those events, and by this time, Hillsborough was just as eager to let Manville go. Soon, petitions were circulated. The referendum took place on April 18, 1929. Only 357 of Manville's population of nearly 5,000 were eligible to vote. Of these, 243 turned out to support the referendum. On that day, Manville was officially born. On May 14, 1929, the first mayor and council were elected, and Gustav Bosel became the first mayor. In less than six months, the elation of becoming free from Hillsborough diminished, because in October of that year, the stock market crashed, bringing on the Great Depression. Johns Manville soon had no work due to the Depression. The federal government began to implement programs such as the Civilian Conservation Corps, CCC, Works Progress Administration, WPA, and the Public Works Administration, the PWA, all designed to put people to work on government projects such as reforestation, building roads, bridges, and public buildings. Manville citizens managed as best they could to cope with the times. The town fathers were thrown into chaos when absentee property owners with vacant lots walked away rather than pay taxes. Revenues fell, and Manville soon was in bankruptcy. Today you have welfare. During the Depression, 
many of our families, uh, our parents were out of work. And so um, we were given uh, help from the federal government. Um, it was called relief. You went to a center, you got uh, a bag of flour, you got a bag of sugar and basic staples, and um, something like uh, a, f a piece of paper that entitled you to uh, maybe uh, $6 of food for the whole week. And we survived because our parents grew vegetables and they, um, they pickled them and they uh, jarred the vegetables and they had chickens. Um, there were people here that had uh, cows. We shared the milk. And this is the way we survived. As the 1930s came to an end, so did the Depression, with the military buildup of due to the gathering war clouds in Europe and elsewhere. The federal government was soon awarding lucrative contracts for military supplies and equipment, and Johns Manville was a recipient. Johns Manville was going full tilt, and with the United States entry into the war in 1941, many of, it, of Manville's sons and daughters were soon called to serve. The post-war years saw Manville continue to grow. Homes and stores sprang up throughout the community. John's Manville continued to boom in the 50s and 60s and the early 70s, employing an average of 2,000 people. Due to the asbestos-related problems, its demise began in the latter part of the 1970s until its final closing here in 1986.